So hello everyone and welcome um, to another episode of the Humans and Wildlife Show. My name is Georgia Terry, and with me as always is my co-host Christian Sase. Christian, what are we going to talk about today? Yes, hi Georgia and hi everyone. Yeah, today we have an interesting topic. What is it? Our 30, is it 39 already? Do you know? Is That's that what my count was. Yeah, I might have <laughs> I can't believe maybe, it. Maybe, maybe, maybe plus 102, but I put it in the episode title, so I guess it's official now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hello, everyone. David Howden, Kit Kat, Sharon Drury, Sylvia Stewart, Mark Corner. Mark, Franklin, yes, I see many friends. And, 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 and welcome, everyone. Today, we have a very interesting topic. It's about oil spill. It's actually quite an important topic because it's the interaction of human and wildlife in a negative and Fortunately, also some positive aspects to it. Uh, but but why this topic? Well, I can tell you, if one grows up with certain things that one sees in the environment, one actually believes that things are like that. And I'm, I'm going right to my childhood that I had in Israel when I was about 10 or 11. I remember we went to the beach. And um, that was the first time we lived close to the beach. So we lived in a place called Herzliya, which is north of Tel Aviv. And we could just walk to the beach. And it's the Mediterranean, of course, the beautiful Mediterranean. And I remember um, going to the beach and then my feet would usually be quite black and they had these brushes and um, some petroleum or so that you could wash your feet. And I thought at that time that, well, that must be, a, you know, this tar must be a natural deposit of the ocean. I was convinced of that for quite some time. And yeah, you, but that's really what <laughs> Continue. <laughs> yeah, I know nobody ever told me that, right? And I thought it was only when I went to South Africa later that I was surprised, where's the tar? You know, there was nothing there that I started realizing, you know, this is, this is unfortunately, a, you know, one of these human side effects. So that's the topic anyway. So here we are. Yeah, that's gross. So like growing up in Israel, you'd go to the beach and it was like walking around on the beach. Like there was this like tar on the rocks or the sand and, that's and also right. the water or mostly it had like accumulated on the shore. Yeah, that's right. And it, it, uh, it, it shows the typical effects and how complex oil actually is because it turns in, you know, as it evaporates, it turns into these horrible clumps and it becomes really slimy and very difficult to remove, actually. And if it yeah. got so difficult for me to remove, well, you can imagine what the impact of wildlife has been. And in fact, Georgia, I just have to add that 2021 for Israel was a very bad year too. And those of you who, who live in the Mediterranean may know this. There was a major um uh illegal dumping uh of of oil in the mediterranean the mediterranean is really a small pond you could say and the beaches were incredibly infect uh, you know affected much worse than i experienced so that's that's where the memories came back yeah it's funny you have those memories i mean it's not funny but i have a similar memory actually when I was a very young child in Seattle, Washington, which is also a coastal city in, in the United States. And I remember we were walking. I was walking with my mom. I was probably like five years old. And I saw all these dead. We were walking by one of the shipping yards. They have mm -hmm. like a bunch of like boating areas and stuff. And we were watching, walking in like the shipping docks. And I looked down and there's all these jellyfish on the top of the water. And I was like, oh, like asking my mom what they are. And she was like, oh, those are jellyfish. And I was asking like what they were doing. And she was like, oh, it looks like they're dead because they were all just floating on the top. And she was like, you know, the water in this, the shipping yard is really polluted. You know, it's like an isolated little alcove. She's like, and there's all this oil from the boats and stuff. She's like, they probably came in here and died. And I was just like so sad as a kid. And for many, many years, like all the way up through like probably 12, 13 years old, I wanted to be a jellyfish doctor when I grew up because of this experience. And I even have my tiny little jellyfish. That's incredible, Georgia. I had no yeah. idea. That's yeah. incredible. That's... That's my origin story. I had no idea. We both had, So we both had childhood uh, experiences with very polluted water. <laughs> I, I, we're just discovering this now. It's amazing. 
Um, yeah, we have a comment that we need a five-hour show just to go through all the places where you've lived, says gentleman. Oh, Gross. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, well, it's so nice that these memories all come up and that, that every time we have something to contribute. But by the way, David Haldens, um, yeah, if you think I'm a pirate, well, <laughs> here, well, this is not a green screen, by the way. This is a taxidermist um, uh, from uh, with kind... Uh, you know, with, with kind thanks to David Hancock or the Hancock Wildlife Foundation that I can keep here for educational purposes. But that's really, so if you think I'm Pirates of the Caribbean now or the Mediterranean or whatever, <laughs> that's not the bald eagle there anyway. So that's where it comes from. <laughs> anyway. yeah. yeah, and we're going to talk more about the bald eagles. We talk yes. about species that were affected by these oil spills. And sure. as you know, so what Christian and I were just talking about is sort of like, maybe from you know smaller pollution events like the accumulation of tar and oil and stuff in the water but sometimes we have a big event a big oil spill yes. um, that happens when something goes seriously wrong and so i'm just going to share a clip real quick sure of that will introduce us to the exxon valdez oil spill which in the united states was one of um at least in the United States, this oil spill is kind of the event that brought in oil spills into like the public sort of consciousness and got people talking about, you know, how should we be um, like legislating, trying to proactively prevent oil spills? What should we do with them afterwards? And so, yeah, I'm just going to play a few minutes from this video. It happened overnight, pristine Alaska wilderness hit by a massive wave of destruction, leaving nothing but profound suffering and death in its wake. At about 11 million gallons, it was the largest oil spill in U.S. history. 1,300 miles of shoreline were oiled. The impact to wildlife was devastating. The livelihoods of the fishing fleets and a way of life in local villages that depend on harvests from the sea were destroyed. The cleanup was hindered due to lack of preparation and equipment. In the first few days, it was primarily local residents, unwilling to sit and do nothing, who went to work, scooping up oil in buckets and rescuing oiled animals. Crews hired by Exxon finally arrived to try to get the oil off the beaches. At its peak, the cleanup effort included approximately 10,000 workers and continued over the next four summers. In 1991, the U.S. District Court approved a civil settlement of $900 million, which Exxon agreed to pay to the United States and the state of Alaska in 10 annual installments. The funds were to... So that's uh, all we're going to share from that, but you can get an idea sort of immediately of... The scope, I mean, this was a huge, huge deal at the time. Um, you know, all of the, not just like, you know, like the millions of gallons of oil, 11 million gallons, they said all the people involved, thousands right. of people involved in the cleanup, um, millions of dollars paid out in money. And of course, you know, thousands of coastline affected, um, thousands of miles of coastline and a bunch of animals um, over... 30, 31 species were listed as severely affected by that oil spill, which surprises me. I bet it's like many, many more species, well, that's, but that's right, um, yes. yeah, yes. and 10 of those have since recovered. Yeah. Yeah, but where do, first the question, where did it come from? So this is the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Terminal uh, that occurred. Uh, so the ship basically took off from, from there. So it's in Alaska, obviously, in, on the 23rd of March, 1989. And, um, you know, uh, at that time, of course, in Alaska, if you've ever been to Alaska, and many of you may have been there, know, will know that there are a lot of icebergs, and, and it's quite dangerous, actually. It's very difficult to maneuver your way, way out of these straits. Um, and that's exactly what, what happened there. So they usually have a pilot on board, and that's, that's what they had. And once, uh, you know, the pilot, and I've been in many ships before, so if you've seen the way this works, the pilot goes on, maneuvers through the difficult parts and then leaves the ship and the captain at that time then has full responsibility to take over the ship but for whatever reason that is 
not quite known the chap the captain then um passed on the yeah he they, they they maneuvered off the main course to avoid an iceberg and then gave over the control to what, what we call the third mate there and went down um and then there must have been some miscommunication completely clear it you know at least as far as i could read it's not exactly what happened but for some reason the the, the ship didn't go um back to the main course where it should have gone and then um obviously uh hit hit the reef i have i have a i have um a, you know a, a, the course of the ship somewhere I, I can share that if you want me to um georgia yeah. but but anyway maybe that's not that important it, it was a major disaster right uh right and i mean the thing is we could nitpick at the details and who yeah. and why and I mean, and certainly, you know, it's, I think there was also, if I recall, Exxon was under some pressure for, you know, having people work like too long of hours or something like exactly. that. Like the captain had been like, maybe exactly. at the helm for like, and, really, drunk, really and, and it was Joseph Hazel, Hazelwood. Yes, Mark, that is correct. That's, that's, his yeah. Name. And so on and so on. It, it, but, it's a good story. Yes. Yeah. And so Exxon Valdez was in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, you know, at the time it was just shocking, but I think it's definitely noteworthy that yes, we have done a lot of restoration work. We're still ameliorating and understanding the effects of this oil spill, but guess what? Also since then, we have had many, many, many more oil spills. In fact, this Exxon Valdez oil spill is no longer even on the list of the top 50 oil spills, the biggest Correct. in the Correct. world. So yeah, we have people, we had someone comment, oh, is this kind of like the BP, Robert Wolf asked, is this kind of like the BP spill? Yeah, but I mean, and, and as Christian is, you did a bunch of research on this, there are definitely bigger oil spills since then. And so I think, um, I do think there's like some hopeful messages like, oh, this actually allowed us to understand a lot about ecology and oh, people yeah. are supposedly more proactive in trying to prevent these now. Um, Mm -hmm. But the ultimate, the bottom line is actually, we have more and more of these big oil spills. So, yeah, yes, uh, and I completely agree with that, Georgia. I mean, we, we've we've learned we've learned a lot. I mean, you know, basically, uh, it's it's very easy to summarize. Oil and water don't mix. It's very difficult, right? It's very difficult. Um, oil, oil is very difficult to contain, and. If you see the impact that it has on wildlife, it's, I mean, I'm not so much on the marine side. I don't understand that so well, but I definitely understand the birds quite well there. And actually my father-in-law was in Cape Town. He was uh, involved in the cleanup that they had also an oil spill off the coast of South Africa. And he told me how difficult it is. So I haven't personally been involved in it, but I've been close enough to people who actually have involved been involved so the the problem why does it affect wildlife so much Re very much from the basics let, let me just quickly explain so if of course you see a bird completely covered by all you know completely black you you know that's the first instance where where um people go out and and help it so what they do is they have these these um big baths of soap that's obviously to to remove the oil it's very intense to do that and it's very difficult actually to remove it why because the feathers are made of barbs and barbules and so they interlink very very nicely like um velcro does right and that's what protects the birds what makes them water resistant but also contains the heat very well the warmth if that seal gets broken they're completely finished right they can't fly properly anymore they're 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 um thermoregulating system doesn't work anymore and so on and the worst is actually not the birds that are completely covered with oil it is those that are partly covered with oil that we don't see those are the one affected because they start preening themselves and they start um you know feeding on the you know on on, on the oil residuals taking them in and they are often missed unfortunately by the environmental groups or the the, the helping groups and um, that has devastating effects and they usually die of some type of intoxication well some some poisoning or so and also um, if there is a thermal leak in the body or so and they cannot preen it properly which is 
almost impossible to clean yourself from oil. They don't have the the, the capabilities of doing that. They usually die because they, they get sick in one way or another. So I just had to, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. really fine. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is the oil is creating a layer, right? Like I just had, um, I just showed up a picture of an oil slick. So like also like a lot of animals get in trouble because the oil in the water forms a lipid layer on the top, right? And then you have to break it up. I mean, that's what soap does. We had a comment about, yeah, Dawn soap, you put mm -hmm. soap in with oil and it basically like ends up the oil like forms these like oil droplets rather than like one big film. And that helps you get it off with water um, because otherwise, yeah, they don't, they don't mix. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's answering some of people's questions. And we had a comment about oil, about wildlife coming back. So I mentioned 30 something species were listed by the U.S. government as severely affected by the Exxon Valdez spill and bald eagles, there were 10 species that as of um, now are like recovered mm -hmm. from that spill and bald eagles are one of them. So bald eagles actually came back fairly quickly. Many other species did not. Otters having a big, trouble, big problems with for otters in the area still. And that's for um, because, for example, the oil is still in the sediment. It's like mm -hmm. you can't get rid of it. And the otters are like, you know, they're getting mussels and, and shellfish basically that are like they're disturbing the sediment. They have to in order to get to their food. And, and that oil is associated with the things that they're eating. Um, a question from David Howden. What's the current thinking on the use of solvents to break up the oil? They do damage too. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes they do. Uh, just very quickly, what the, what the first thinking was, of course, to use... Uh, to, to use hot water, that's what I would have done too, right, on the beaches. That's what they did initially, right, uh, to, because it breaks up oil easy and, and at least it doesn't, uh, you know, you're not using any any solvent, but they quickly found out that that would affect the microorganisms or the small organisms. They, they were basically being cooked, so they stopped that. They started using high-pressure cold water to remove a lot of that. Then what they also do is they burn off last, uh, large areas. That's what, what happened, uh, especially in the... Um, in the event uh, of, of the um, the deep water horizon. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, che chemicals, oh my goodness, uh, David Howell, I'm not an expert on that, but I do know that the the, the reef, the, 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 you know, the, all the coral reefs were badly affected also by the chemicals. There's no simple solution. There's only one solution is, for goodness sakes, don't spill oil. The, pro the problem is, as, just as Georgia says, it still continues and also illegal you know, illegally, it, it does still um, continue. And it's very difficult to trace where these things come from. Yeah, I mean, I think to some degree, if you're moving huge, huge amounts of oil from place to place, I mean, leaks in pipelines are going to happen. Boats capsizing are going to happen. Like, it's unavoidable, I think, to some degree to have accidents to some degree are unavoidable. Um, and I mean, the, I think you have to make sure that like the accident is like costly enough to the company, probably that it's definitely yes. not worth their time. It must hurt. It must hurt. It. Yeah. Yes. I mean, because we have in, um, in Michigan here, the state that I live in, in the United States, there is an oil pipeline that goes under one of the Great Lakes. It's um, submerged. I forget if it's in Lake Michigan or Lake Huron, um, but it's under one of them. And people have been complaining for a long time that this pipeline transporting all this oil is like really old. I've seen pictures of it that people have gone down and dived and takes and it's just like, um, it's like an accident waiting to happen, you know? So why don't things like that get addressed sooner? Yeah. Yeah, so the effect of, um, of, of the Exxon uh, Valdez was, they estimate 250,000 seabirds, 2,800 otters, 300 seals, 250 bald eagles, and 20 killer whales. And that's just what one could see, right? That's a visual. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what one is. And there were about 10,000 responders to clean up the oil spot. Can you imagine that? One, sorry, I'm just going to switch <laughs> off. That's I, David I, Hancock. That's a comment, but I won't let him come in. <laughs> sorry about that. That's David Hancock. Okay, fine. Yeah, there is a question from Frankman under yeah. means through. Um, I think you're talking, you're asking about the pipe, the oil pipeline, and it 
I mean, yeah, it goes, it basically crosses the bottom, bo the body of the Great Lake and the pipeline, it's like sunken, it's submerged. So it goes along the floor of the Great Lake, yeah. Um, which if you can think, like if you have a huge oil spill in one of our Great Lakes, I mean, I forget that the Great Lakes that we have in the United States and Canada, that's the, that borders the countries, um, they have a ton of the world's fresh water. I think the African Rift, the, there's African Great, Great Lakes system that's technically more volume of water because they're very deep. But the Great Lakes in North America are um, the second biggest like Great Lakes freshwater system. And they have, they're the biggest in terms of the surface, um, the, how much of like the surface area of the water that's exposed um, because the rift lakes in Africa are like extremely like deep. Mm -hmm rifts yeah so there's a lot of like ecosystems there's, there's a lot of solar exposure in the north american great lakes and a lot of like ecosystems and stuff and you can just imagine if you have a big oil spill there it's going to get everywhere like the great lakes are connected yes. um, to each other largely and so that would be really bad yeah it's you know you know georgia it's also very difficult i always find it difficult to comprehend how many gallons if you talk about millions or so it doesn't mean anything what i find maybe a little bit easier to to comprehend in a, an oil spill is we all know what an olympic sized swimming pool looks like you know because i think we've all been swimming at some time we know how large that is so the um the exxon um valdez was about 17 uh, olympic sized swimming pool that's a lot you know if you, if you look at that and if you come to the oil spill that happened in the deep uh, water horizon so of uh, a lot of the uh, you know of the coast of louisiana and many of you will know that it's 20 times that amount so you're talking about i mean this is already in uh, you can't you can't comprehend this anymore this is somewhere around three to four hundred olympic sized swimming pools you're talking about and that's crazy isn't it so. yeah it really quickly gets into the realm of like difficult really difficult to wrap your brain yeah. around um there's a comment mm -hmm. from Larry Shirpe. Ship anchors have dragged onto oil pipelines, moved out of place and caused leaks. This happened off California coastlines. Shell oil, harder ground, um, chitis and shrimp shells, etc., helped to separate and gather oil together to be vacuumed. A problem. That's another thing, yeah, oil vacuuming. That's one of the strategies that people use to suck it up while you can, while it's all grouped together. Um, and also that reminds me of, I should look up a picture, um, but also like we have these devices now to try to contain the oil better, like basically because the oil floats to the top of the water, you can get like a, um, a buoy system to help sort of rein it in. Um, let me, I'll look up a thick picture. But I think in, in general, one can say that maybe 10 to 20% of, of all the leak can, can be contained, right? Most of it cannot. Uh, it's it's and especially when you start having ocean currents and you have strong winds uh you know it, it quickly becomes mission impossible right so um yeah the cost that was interesting that georgia was talking about the cost so the the initial cleanup of the exxon valdez was about two two billion i think the the estimates plus the fines go somewhere to six billion if you look at the deep water horizon you're talking probably about 80 billion in total that's and 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 that's the only way you know to to contain these things is it, it has to hurt financially in order to you know to the company say you know what we we, we um it's 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 really worth our while because unfortunately i mean i was i remember especially when the deep water uh horizon um you know of, of bp uh, that that happened i was very shocked to see the ceo i mean I've, I've been ceo of a small company and so on but i was very shocked about the irresponsibility of his statements and it was it really caused a lot of outrage at that time and and these things shouldn't happen right i mean people no matter what industry they are they have to take responsibility to you know for 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 the consequences and um yeah so, yeah and yeah we have another comment yeah exactly like natural disasters when there's like a hurricane you have these big uh, like oil like buoys offshore mm -hmm. those they there have been oil spills that were because of um natural disasters like interfering with the infrastructure as well um yeah and i mean to some degree 
we are all responsible, I think. We all use yes. oil. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Of course. Of course. We can't wash our hands off that. Absolutely. Right. I agree. I 100% agree. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. that's the unfortunate truth is we all use oil. We all really like we were not just we don't just use it we rely on it like our society relies on it and so then that creates a tremendous incentive to transport oil from one place to another kind of regardless of the risks regardless yes. of the costs we had a comment a little bit earlier from someone saying yes. that they were thinking of switching to hybrid um, vehicles and they you know more and more people are going that way um, and that technology is improving with time certainly as well. Well, that, that's another nice subject. We can talk about that once about electric cars, a wonderful subject, by the way. So we can, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, but that's, we'll talk about it in relation to wildlife, right? So that's, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah, I always wonder the like, the one downside I can imagine with electric cars is like, oh, they're so quiet that like, I wonder if animals would get hit more often. I mean, certainly people, people uh, have raised concerns about humans getting hit more often by these cars. Um. You know, I, Georgia, I think it has all to do with responsibility. I mean, over the weekend, I, I, I went to the Okanagan again and because I just love the wildlife there. The mm -hmm. ospreys have come back, by the way. It's a big thing, you know, for wonderful. So they just return. And um, I was noting we have a wildlife corridor there. And, and, and you, you always get one or two stupid people, I have to say. Most people are responsible. One or two, they just drive like crazy. They think this is a racing track. And that's the problem. The kinetic energy of a car is proportional to the velocity squared, right? So it doesn't matter whether you have an electric car or or, or a gas or, or, or you know gasoline car. It's the energy that is contained, right? And if you just drive irresponsibly, and unfortunately there are a few such people everywhere, uh, that's those are the hazard, right? And and so I think it's less about the sound. It's just you know being being responsible. That's what yeah. We have a question, are any of the alternative energies considered fossil fuels? Um, none of, at least in like American English, when we say alternative energy, it's an alternative to fossil fuels. There are, um, there are differences within fossil fuels in how harmful they are. So like, for example, petroleum is often considered not quite as bad in some regards, because I know like if you're heating your house with petroleum rather than mm -hmm. gas, like petroleum gives you more um, bang per unit. It's slightly more cost yes. effective and just carbon footprint wise, it's slightly more effective. Yeah. So there are differences within the fossil fuels. But yes, we have, I mean, that's a separate topic. Of course, we have to do the migration much more to renewable energy. But I can tell you, I've been years also in, in renewable energy. There's no one solution for everything, right? It's just that we have to migrate because in, in Canada, we have a problem also with, with hydropower. You have too much of it. You destroy the environment too. Everything has to be done in a responsible way. The same with solar, the same with wind energy, as you know, the impacts and so on. But, and I'll say something that's maybe unpopular for another point, nuclear energy is also an important alternative because we have to balance everything in some way. And there's, uh, there, there has to be a trade-off um, with, with all kinds of risks in life. But that's a topic for, its, for itself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so to be clear, like, I think we should be moving towards alternative and actually, yeah, Christian, this is, we're moving on another topic, but we yeah. promise you, Christian has great, great um knowledge as a physicist and and we both have a lot of environmental knowledge and we can talk a lot about this because alternative energies i think the key is having a diversity of alternative energies that you can use in conjunction with each other obviously not everywhere is going to be able to use like tidal energy for example or wind power or solar power um, but a big thing with alternative energies is the limiting factor is battery like the ability to store that yes. energy our battery technology needs to improve a lot. Um, and and we can talk about that in another episode, maybe very soon. Yeah, so, Robert, no, no, that's great that you brought it up because I think we, we should spend a bit of time on that. It's a it's a mm -hmm. great topic and it really uh, um, it, 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 it 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 really needs needs time to go through it because it's there's no Unfortunately, there's never a simple answer. We definitely know we have to go to renewables. I'm a person who very strongly, unfortunately, would say 
um, sees the effects of climate change. I see so much evidence as a scientist, and I find it in, uh, I, I, I find it irre irrefutable. Unfortunately, I have to say I wish I was different, but I, I cannot refute the evidence that I see, and that leads us to the that that we have to think in different ways. And also, I mean, if you look at the world conflicts that we have now, look at Europe's situation with Ukraine and other things, um, there, there has to be you know. There, there has to be a way away from all gas and so on. It just is too much risk for the world, right? We, we have to move. Yeah. And just to highlight um, the sort of oh, complications yes. arise, it's not like to get back to the oil, to the oil spill topic, mm -hmm. like it's not that using oil is, has, is without its complications and its side costs, right? And um, so this is just showing like sort of how complicated that can be, right? David Howden brought this up, the use of chemicals to sort of um, make the oil go from the slick into droplets. So we have like a plane that's dispersing the, the chemicals that break up the, the surface slick into yes. droplets. Um, and then like some of the droplets sink. Also, some of them are rising though. I don't understand exactly what's going on there, but there's um, and then like, there's like a, this plume of droplets that gets carried away by ocean currents, which mm -hmm. is that the goal basically that used to be just to spread it all out and send it somewhere else mm -hmm. that used to be for a long time, the motto in the United States back mm -hmm. in the seventies, this, the solution to pollution is dilution. That's what they, <laughs> so, that's what I never, heard, I never heard of that one. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was that was like our government's our government right? motto or an environment environmental managers more generally. They were like, the world is huge, earth is big. So yeah, pollution is a problem, but if we can just like spread it out enough, then it'll just kind of go away. And obviously we I think in the 70s at least, we started to realize, oh wait, we can't, that's not enough we are putting so much pollution into the environment that even though the world is big, it's not big enough that we can just get rid of it by sending it off. Well, well um, you know, it's, it's so interesting talking about this, uh, Georgia, because I think in the States, I mean, I think the United States is one of the most blessed countries in the world. Uh, in my, I mean, I've been a lot around, but if you look at a per surface area, there's probably no country that is as blessed as the United States, because it has so much agriculture, so much everything. I mean, look at Canada in comparison. Or look, take Russia and so on. They're large, uh, you know. They're, there's there's they're large lands that you simply cannot use for agriculture. So in the states, it's just amazing, right? I mean, you know the states much better than I do. But but um, coming from that, I have to think of a visit I did to Palm Springs on a, on a conference, and I was amazed. You know, you come to Palm Springs, it's it's so hot and so dry, and there they have these golf uh, golf courses and everything. And I came to the hotel, and said, "My God, this is amazing!" You know, just air conditioned everywhere, and just and I went up to them and I said, "How do you do this? I mean, this is desert. How do you do?" This? And he said, "We have an infinite well below there. We are blessed." And I thought, "Yeah, that's the United States, but..." It's unfortunately you're not blessed forever, right? It's just it's just this attitude, right? It's yeah, they're like hashtag blessed. We're using up all this stuff that we've yes. gotten from other countries, and yeah, we're it's the equivalent in the U.S. right now of I guess like accumulating a ton of credit card debt that you're gonna have to pay the piper for later, or that other countries, other people are paying the cost for right now. Um, I did side note. I did recently see that. Canada recently surpassed the United States in terms of um, immigration, like where yeah. people are immigrating. To. Have, Maybe it's per have. capita. Yeah. yeah. But have. I think, I think the, the U S is like a little bit, maybe on its uh, going downhill in terms of, yeah, how we're managing things basically. Oh, people David like Hancock wants to join the conversation. I, I, I thought he would, but you know what? I think let's save that for next time rather. You know, and 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 if oh. we, that's what you think, Georgia, or, because I I think that's possible. It's just uh, I, I, um, I don't maybe. know. Oh yeah, you know what? I can. Let's. Yeah, the, why the, not? Well, we can we can do that. The only thing is, uh -huh. um, no. Well, let me let me. Okay, let well, me. Just, 
I know and you want to talk about the water just, horizons. Just, though. One second. I'm just going to put myself on silent. I'm just going to listen to the voicemail where he left. He always leaves a voicemail. One second. Okay, you go on. Okay, I'm just going to talk then, I guess. <laughs> um, that's totally fine. Just put me on the spot. Yeah, so I guess while I'm here on my own, I can talk a little bit more about the ecological effects. And I wonder if that's what David Howden wants to join us to talk about a little bit as well. So like certainly all species are not affected the same by this. Um, so Christian talked a little bit about like the birds and how their feathers are particularly negatively affected by the oil. And, um, and we also talked a little bit about how the bald eagles recovered pretty quickly and how the sea otters were on the conversely particularly sensitive because they're eating these sort of like bottom dwelling oil associated um, oil associated things. So another thing that can affect, in addition to like what food you're eating immediately, um, another thing that it can affect like how sensitive a species is to the oil spill is how far up the food chain it is. So often what we'll see is that the higher up you are, like toxins, and I don't know about oil, but certainly like sort of unhealthy pollutants in the environment can accumulate in an organism. We're starting to see, you know, fish full of bits of plastic, for instance. And um, basically like you have what's called like bioaccumulation where like at one level of the food chain, like, okay, this one big fish is eating all these little fish full of plastic. Each little fish has a little bit of plastic. And then one big fish eats like 10 little fish and suddenly this big fish has like a ton of plastic in it. And then, you know, a pelican or something eats like a bunch of these fish and then it has even like a way, way more amount of plastic in it. And so like animals that are higher up in the food chain can be more sensitive because at each stage, the animals below it are kind of concentrating the pollutants or toxins in the environment. Um, so that's called, yeah, those are, those are two things um, one is called biomagnification and one is called bioamplification. Um, and I'm, and that, that was basically thanks for jumping in. That was incredible. Fine. Georgia, you did so well. That's I'm, totally fine. By the way, I'm just trying to get hold of David Hancock. Yes, he did want to join the conversation. So my Oh David Hancock, not Howden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that, yeah my, my apologies. I didn't realize that. I thought it was oh, yeah. Um, so I, I just, yeah, but, but now he's not answering. He maybe he's doing something else. Oh yeah. Well, why don't you talk about, so I, we hinted at the beginning that unfortunately Exxon Valdez was just the beginning of our problems with that oil spill. So Christian, yes. you followed up with one of the oil spills that came later. Yeah, that is right. That, I mean, I mean, this is something that we all probably me, uh, remember very well that, you know, the, um, the, the, the deep water horizon one. And what's devastating about that one, it, it was actually quite complex. Again, um, you know, the the um, the cause is 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 more complex. It's it's a chain of human errors, right? And and shortcuts. It's usual. I mean, anybody who's 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 worked in in you know in in the energy industry, and I I have myself knows how time critical things are. And that one starts taking shortcuts, uh, you know, as 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 soon as as one lags behind, because I mean it's all about dollars, right? Uh, so that's all. That seems to be what happened there. There were shortcuts taken. I, I don't know exactly which one, so I'm not going to. I can't expand on that. But I do know that that um, they, they 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 were drilling obviously in the Gulf of Mexico, and um, didn't didn't realize the uh, the the um, the geology. Or, or didn't do enough uh, examination there. What happened was that that they suddenly had an explosion there on the on the ocean floor, and um, tons of oil were suddenly released. Also, people were killed. It was it was incredible, and they had no idea how to you know how to how to stop that 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 leakage. So it went on in short for three months. For three months, the uh, uh, the, the leakage went on. They had absolutely no idea what to do, and the the devastation was was about twenty times as bad as what the ExxonMobil uh, uh, accident had, from from what I read, and that happened all I think it was around the twentieth of April, twenty ten, and um, it yeah I mean the devastation was much more. Yes, Georgia one had learned something from the ExxonMobil 
uh, from, from the Exxon Valdez uh, accident, one had learned something from it. And they knew, for example, you know what to do and what not to do. But but uh, to contain to contain the spill was nearly impossible. Um, I think there were. Let me just check here. If I well, anyway, it was. It must have been around uh, three hundred olympic size swimming pools that were i mean we don't even know what that means right uh so what had what, what did one learn they knew that spawning fish were very affected and uh crucially affected initially they always thought it's it's like herring they looked at herring that's that's uh, initially what they did uh when the exxon valdez um catastrophe happened because um fish also react differently but spawning herring recovered within a year and they thought, well, that's the way wildlife works. And then they found out it's much more complex. No, um, salmon work completely different. They are affected for years. Dolphins were badly affected by just small, just small uh, amounts and so on. The, the, the coral reef were completely affected and so on and so on. There was a whole food chain that, that is associated with it. Um, Georgia, if I can, I'll try and just see if i can share my screen just give me a second because i have sort of a diagram on it um mm -hmm. let me... yeah you should be able to hit share screen at the bottom yeah one second please i i had so many windows open that i need to just find the correct one just give me a second please yeah and definitely like as you know christian mentioned a little bit ago but it's not just animals that are negatively affected by these oil spills it's also people you know, the people that are honestly off, often having to work in sort of just very difficult conditions for these companies. Um, also, you know, people who've had their livelihoods destroyed, all the fishing industry in that area of Alaska was just, you know, you can't fish and then sell those fish to people to eat when there's been an oil spill there. Um, there's indigenous groups who had their way of life, um, similarly because of the fishing had their way of life just like horribly devastated by this oil spill. So there are very substantial impacts on people as well. Yeah, so for, uh, I just found out Georgia that, that uh, again, my Mac, my, the, the, the Mac won't allow me to share because it thinks it's, oh. so I have to give it permission. I can't do that. Can you <laughs> so, send me the link or something? Yeah, it's, um, you know, that's a great idea because it's such a, it's such an incredible diagram. Give me a second, I will do that, yes. Yeah. Um, um, while he does that, I'll talk a little bit about the costs because Christian was also just talking about like the cost benefit of, you know, these companies are under pressure to deliver a product and they're getting a lot of money. It's, you know, there's a lot of money driving these factors, um, but talking a little bit about the cost of the cost of the what it really means, like we talked about billions of dollars being spent um, in these recovery effort, efforts. So just a little bit of an example, oops, of how that money comes. Um, this is a report that Christian actually found replacement yep. costs of birds and mammals. And you can see it's a little bit old. It's from 1992. Um, so, you know, a little under 10 years after the Exxon Valdez spill. Um, and it focuses, as you can see, on the Exxon Valdez um, consequences. And so one of the things they talk about is the cost of get capturing these animals to clean them and rehabilitate them um, or to try to potentially tra capture them from somewhere else and you know move them once the restoration is complete possibly to um, an area. But of course that isn't, most areas that have undergone an oil spill are not ready to have like animals being translocated there yet. But they talk about a permit, um, the, the cost to capture a sea, a single sea otter can be as high as 50,000 US dollars. Um, and in addition to that, um, so, you know, you're capturing potentially a bunch of different animals um, to give them, you know, for, you have to transport them, you have to sedate them, they have to see a vet. So that gets very costly. Um, and then here's the, the kicker. You spend all this money catching an animal, cleaning it up, making sure it's healthy. You release it somewhere new, somewhere that hasn't undergone a, a devastating oil spill. But guess what? The animal wants to go back to its home. It doesn't want to go to the new yes. place you put it. And so many of these animals, as they say here, have strong homing instincts. And so they just go oh, right wow. back to that area that underwent the oil spill. Um, 
And so they're like, you know, one solution to avoid having animals just go back to this polluted place that you don't want them going back to, one solution is to raise them from juveniles and then release them to try to like replace um, the otters that were killed or whatever. But that, as you can imagine, raising an animal from birth is very expensive. So they say here as an, uh, an, as an illustration, um, raising eagles from eggs into a surviving adult can cost $15,000. I assume that's $15,000 per eagle, all the food it's eating, the wages for the people that have to take care of it. So that's just an example of, um, of how much work it is to try to fix something after the fact. Like I think our efforts are much better spent preventing oil spills in these situations. All right, so Christian, you sent me the link. I'm gonna open it up now um, and share it as well. Okay, so I think you're, oh, I think Christian is muted. I think he's on the phone. Um, well, I have never seen this diagram before in my life. So whoever wants to jump in in the chat and help me with interpreting it, feel free. Okay. Um, Georgia, yeah. I've, I've just got, I just got one moment. I've, I finally got David Hancock on the, so David, are you there? David? Yes. Okay. You wanted to comment something on the oil. Go ahead. I did. Well, but okay. I've got you on here. I need to figure out how to get your speaking off um, because I can't hear with you talking. How do I do that? Okay. So we, right. got, we got some technical problems. I'm oh. gonna I'm gonna take Christian away for a little bit um, and continue. He's left me on my own with this complicated diagram. So it looks like they have um, these different circles are going out into sort of different types of exposure. So the innermost circle is exposure routes. Okay, so it starts with a drop of oil. The oil, I guess, can be in the water, food, air, or sediment. Um, and then we go through, we have some sort of exposure to the animal. So it breathes it in, aspiration, um, or inhaling. I don't know what aspiration is then, I guess. It, it breathes it in, it eats it, it gets absorbed into its body somehow. Um, from there, the oil has some sort of, I guess, immediate way in which it affects the body. Either it, uh, it can do damage to the DNA, um, it can mess up the DNA in a way that alters downstream gene expression, um, ion channel dysfunction, I assume that's because it's like messing with the cell membranes. Like literally, if you think about a cell in the human body, it has a, um, we have a phospholipid bilayer. So we have kind of, you know, a type of lipid, a type of oil-based substance making up the very um, structures of our cells. And so you can imagine like adding more oil can, uh, it can be really problematic for that. Yeah, Gentleman Ghost says, doctoral test putting Georgia on the spot today. Yep, that's exactly what's happening to me right now. Um, oh, can I make it any bigger? I think I can take away the chat for a moment and that will be what really makes it bigger. So let me take it away. Um, I can still see your chats, but you all can't see each other's chats now. So please keep sharing. Oh, Christian's wants to come back. Hey, Christian. Okay, thanks. Georgia, you explained that very well, by the way. I, I'm sorry, I would have explained this, but that's from a scientific article. So, no, anyway. you're fine. So we didn't get through very much of it yet. Okay. Um, anyway, I've, I've got David Hancock. Finally, uh, we, we've got this solved. So my apologies for can you Can you tell him to hang on for one second so we can okay, just I'll go hold through on, the figure so okay, we're not jumping second. around? Yeah. So, um, yeah, Christian, what else do you have to say about this? We talked about the oil, drop of oil and then you get exposed and then it has some sort of immediate effect in the body. Um, I guess it, and it basically seems to radiate out at some point to whole organism level effects. Like it affects the bird, the invertebrate. And even I would say it radiates farther than that. It affects the whole ecosystem, right? Um, by affecting the individual animals. But yeah, Christian, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, that's that's exactly what this is a this is about, right? Uh, you, I think you explained it well. So I'm going to put David Hancock on on now. David, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can. I I've enjoyed your program, and, and I couldn't help but want to comment because some of the things you were saying 
many of them were right on, but there was a couple of things that are, are absolutely contradictory to my long-standing uh, involvement with the Valley Bill, including I published books oh. by a biologist who spent 20 years studying the recovery of, of the herring and various things there, and it was kind of very different uh, what his final conclusions after well, we didn't talk very specifically about herrings. I think that, yeah, that the different animals have had very different responses is one of the things that yeah. came out of this. It was kind of, let me just briefly then tell you, when I, I was just at the time when, when the big spill, the, the deep water one off, off uh, Louisiana and Texas was happening, I had already planned to go up and do a tour of the Aleutian Islands with this biologist and do some bird censuses. And I, I got him on the phone the night before I was about to leave to, from here. And he says, oh, David, I just had a call from Obama's White House that I have to go there tomorrow, the very day we were going to start. He says, I have to present uh, what I think is now the long-term effect of nearly, it was 19 years then, of effort, of recovery efforts in uh, from the Exxon Valdez, so they had a better perspective of what was happening off Texas. And he says, my conclusion is, we're not talking billions, it was like $7 trillion of cost of the wildlife recovery, what they had lost. And it, that just shortly after he went down there and came back another year and a half, uh, the Exxon Valdez, which kind of is a contradiction to the first no, uh, news report that you yeah, did. Yeah, and can I interject, Christian? Can you hear me? Yeah, so I'm going to interject real quick and say, oh, like. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Hang, on, hang on, David. Uh, uh, Georgia wants to say something. Just one sec. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to interject. Yeah, just like, um, like David just, David Hancock just said. So. You know, we have an estimate there of the oil spill costing trillions of dollars in terms of the effects on wildlife, how much it's costing us as a society. And Christian earlier talked about the cost that ended up getting spent by Exxon Valdez, which was billions of dollars. So Exxon Valdez, um, the cost to them was sort of basically exponentially lower than the cost to the ecosystem the society, etc. Sorry, continue on, David Hancock. Oh, okay, so the point is, there's, that's one point, is, is the long-term effect that most people don't count. One of the other big elements that um, he brought into this long, long-term study um, about the cost was that they had been initially fined all these hundreds of millions of dollars, but after 21 years, of then uh, objecting to this through various courts. Finally, uh, in about 2000, Exxon got out of paying any, any, any of the damages. Now they had paid for some of the work crews, a few people walking along the beaches, but that was relatively nothing, a few million dollars, nothing to do with the hundreds of millions that they had been fined and they didn't have to pay them. They got out of them uh, by a, a final 20, I think it was just a, nearly 21 years of court challenges, and they finally got out of having to pay all that money that you had inferred they'd been fined. That, sure, they had been, but they got out of paying. So, you know, you pointed out earlier, we've learned some things, but the main thing we've learned about these oil but not only, as you say, there's more of them, uh, there's more creatures that are actually uh, killed off. There's more oil released in every new, big, you know, tanker spill. Uh, and, and so there's just more costs associated with the recovery. So we've learned all this, but we don't do anything about it. There's every boat that floats. I mean, they can put an extra layer, the new boats have two layers of skin on them, you know, metal covering. But you still run them up on the rocks, they cut through both of them. So the, the challenges are, as you kind of inferred, it just, it, it's not feasible cost-wise to try to add in the cost of these losses against general climatic costs and so on. So I, I just, 
I, every time I hear somebody referring to some of these first signs, I get excited because Exxon challenged all of them and they got out of paying any of them. Absolutely astounding. So uh, people shouldn't be saying about what they got fined because they didn't have to pay it. Yeah, but BP got heavily fined. I mean, I, yeah. I mean they did. Yeah, I think it's still a lesson learned. So it's like, and I think they did pay the first fines, which were in, I think they did pay millions of dollars. They paid a few million dollars to, yeah. have, the, to have the beaches clean. That, that's quite true. But the, yeah. big, the, the big fines that you referred to, they challenged all this, and it took 20 the years billions. in court before under, it was actually, we won't even say uh, the guy's name, a previous president under him, um, uh, the right wing court finally threw out all the costs against Exxon 20 years after the accident. I mean, it, it's bizarre. Totally yeah. bizarre. And I think that that probably goes in lessons learned, right? So, yeah, the initial charges that Exxon got was they got 200 something million in criminal charges, they got 900 million in, um, in like penalties for cleaning up the spill and stuff and those were paid out over 10 years so they ended up paying like one billion probably ish but then as christian said later on we have this bigger oil spill where they do end up paying billions and that was probably like honestly the government learning a little bit oh how do we set this stuff up from the beginning so that we're actually going to be able to get a bunch of money out of these companies if something bad happens um so it's a learning curve not just in terms of ecological learning and how do we restore things and how do we prevent oil spills but also learning in terms of like uh how do we find companies when they really mess up really badly perhaps yeah yeah well thank you so much for joining us david hancock we'll have to have another episode where maybe we talk about like eagles and and their response to the oil spill, because I was surprised to hear that eagles were one of the species to recover relatively quickly um, relative to others. Yes, they lost They lost quite a few, uh, uh, I think it was 1,200 eagles, 900, I might have that reversed, 900 otters and 1,200 eagles that were actually killed in the oil um, as, right, right off the bat. Um, that, that's not talking about long-term impact. That was the initial numbers that they found on the beaches that were oil. Um, so those are a certain costs. Um, we've just been dealing into this kind of cost to an environmental things. And the United States Fish and Wildlife Service has done, in, in the last numbers of years, it goes back a long way, they've been studying the cost of environmental disruptions and the cost of repairing these things. And on an eagle's nest now, they, they have come up with the cost of trying to replace the eagle. You have to replace a tree and you have to replace live eagles and you have to raise them and you have to do all these things. And they came up with the fact that it would be $83,000 to replace an eagle. Um, um, for, with a nesting facility, um, which is you know more than a hundred thousand of our money uh, per nest. So I know we we're just working all this data into into the bigger picture costs that we're trying to um, get understood here. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it, it's fascinating. I'm glad you're doing this topic, but and, and I think George has touched on it, so Christian. We, we've learned a lot of things, but the biggest thing we've learned out of this is you can't stop people, whether it's a drunk captain on the boat or whether it's just pure accidents or whatever causes these accidents. You can't stop accidents. No, you can't it's, stop accidents. Just, Absolutely it's, not. They're just going to happen. I would different. agree. I would agree with that. Yeah, yes, and with more and more traffic around yep. the world, all the time, these are bigger and bigger likelihoods of happening and they are bigger oil tankers and everything is bigger mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, this is one of the things that caused many of us here to uh, you know shed tears over this decision to put a pipeline into vancouver yep. it makes no sense to go from a few right. tankers per year to double triple and, and so on the number it's only going to increase the the frequency and the well, first the likelihood and then the frequency of, of a catastrophe there's no other option yeah all right well good on you um yeah. I, um 
I got involved in all of these oil things way back in the 60s when, I, when Bank Victoria had a good old oil spill in the harbor, just a little one, but I got to uh-huh. start and learn how to treat all the seabirds. There you go. I got eagles, I got puffins and murres. That's wow. why I was called to the big Santa Barbara oil spill. I got, went down there to help the, the recovery down there, but that's a long time ago now. But, hmm. um, you know, it still happens all the time. Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing about, yeah, well, we should have you on. We want to hear about how you clean up animals and from oil spills yes. and go about rehabilitating them and stuff. That would be a really cool topic, too. Yeah. Well, there's lots of people who are doing this today much better than we, we first learned with Dawn So, Well, find, yeah, find someone, find someone who's had more recent experience and we can have you both on. And we can hear about how in practice your rehabilitation and cleanup um, of wildlife efforts have like improved over time or changed. That'd be cool. Well, it, it certainly has improved in the sense that we've learned how to physically get the birds quickly cleaned and get the waterproofing back. The, the person started to point out not only when the fine feathers quit interlocking. The big thing about the hypothermia is as soon as feathers lose their interlocking ability, the water penetrates from the outside all the way to the skin, and that's what kills the birds from the hypothermia. It's the fact that the water, having penetrated that outer feather protection, goes right straight through to the bird, and and then, of course, it causes it, it to die from cold. So, yeah, a lot of these things are just very, very difficult to try and recover. Getting the bird out of the water quickly mm. so it's not cold is essential, but not, not at all practical in many cases. The birds are dead long before the recovery people even get there. You know, it's a challenge. It's, it's a huge challenge. And, and uh, a lot of people dedicate their lives to trying to help and assist, but it, it's a struggle to do it in a practical sense. Okay, David. Th- thanks a lot for those precious comments and especially your experience. But let's let's um, devote another you know another session to this. I think it's it's yeah. it would be very worth it. Thanks. Okay. Thank yeah, you. definitely. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, David. Yeah. Okay. Some people might recall the like knitting sweaters for the penguins thing after a different oil spill to try to keep them warm um, because their feathers had lost their heat retention. Um, yeah, the big problem. So, well, well, Georgia, you did very well today because you also jumped in. I put you on the spot without wanting to. I did it wasn't intentional, so I apologize. But oh, it's all you, you good. Well. I'm used to being put on the spot all the time. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, all right. I'm turning on back on chat overlay for the last little bit. So, any final comments? Add them now. Um, only things that unfortunately it doesn't show just like the chat stream it only shows comments as they come in but yeah i think we have a lot of potential future directions here we've set ourselves up really nicely to talk about um alternative energies yes soon and also digging in a little bit more in depth to how different species specifically are can be rehabilitated by and affected and are affected by these oil spills um yeah and yeah as uh, maximus says unfortunately many state governments in the u.s are turning against the practice of wildlife rehabilitation so people um yeah and so i'll comment on that and i think it's that's a fair point because as we saw it costs a lot and it's not as effective as preventing and so i i could see the argument i don't know if this is true but i can definitely see the argument for putting that money towards prevention rather than um, spending a lot of effort trying to clean up one bird mm-hmm. sucks. That's the that's the pragmatic environmental manager in me. But of course, Georgia would, you know, go and do it anyway. Spend her money. <laughs> yeah, go and spend her money or her time. Yes, you would. Trying to well, I would it. do the same. It's Yeah. Sure. Christian, oh. final thoughts? Yeah. No, that's, um, you know, I, I, I thought this was a very interesting session. I, th- I thought it was probably one of the most difficult ones because uh, it's also very emotional, honestly. I mean, 
you know, I, I haven't uh, been involved personally like David Hancock has, but I know people who have, and it gets very much to my heart. So I actually found this difficult to present and uh, hope, hopefully you, you found it interesting enough that uh, it'll do something to change us in some way or another. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you everyone for joining. We will see you next week. Everyone take care. And I guess your assignment, your homework for the next week is to think about how you can reduce um, your use of, of gas and oil and fossil fuels over the next week. We want to hear when I, you know, at the beginning of next week's episode, I'm going to ask you all, what was one little thing you did to reduce your use of fossil fuels this week? I've just a little 1% change that you're going to maybe use 1% less oh, that's fossil a, fuels that's over a the good, coming year. Maybe that's the topic for next week, Georgia. I think that's a great topic because I know you 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 have a big story to tell there. So, but also, you know, then what's the impact on wildlife? That's the question, really. It's not only that, but how does that impact wildlife in, in whatever way? I mean, I always have to think when we had Isa here, the way she was talking about the natural garden, you know, just letting things grow. Right? Mm -hmm. Which is so oh, yeah, we, we have no Mo May here in Ann Arbor, where May is a very important month to let the wildflowers come May. up. It's spring here. It's just starting yeah. to get warm. We had snow a couple of days ago. Um, but yeah, no Mo May. It's good for the insects. They all they're yeah. they're just coming out of this long winter. They're almost at the end of this of this marathon they've been running to make it through winter and they want their food sources to come back those spring flowers and and the grass and things to eat and things to be leafy so anyways we're getting more and more off topic but everyone <laughs> yeah i i'm going to start assigning homework at the end of every episode and Good. <laughs> that's your homework reduce your fossil fuels make some lifestyle change to reduce your fossil fuel by one percent or more i want to hear about it Okay. Very good. Let's talk about that next time. I think it's a great topic. Okay. okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.